All right, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. We are going to be presenting today on how to utilize your IRA within LLCs and trust to utilize checkbook control of the funds within those particular types of accounts. If you could please for me type all of your questions into the chat box as the raise hand function and the audio on your end to speak in have been muted. So please do make sure you type them in. I will answer the questions as they come up and it does certainly help to enrich the presentation for all of those involved. So please keep those questions coming in frequently and as they come up. Your moderator today, my name is Alex Perney. I'm a certified IRA services professional. Here with Advanta IRA, I've been doing this for about six years. I have experience in doing investments for clients, uh, doing account management, uh, education sales. I have a pretty well-rounded career with uh, re regards to my experience in handling these different types of structures of assets, these different asset classes, how clients like to administer, in some cases self-administer in these particular structures, the types of assets and how they are doing things. So uh, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, ask them regarding any of the types of um, uh, points that you might be needing some more clarification on today. Some of the key points I really like for people to take away from this, as this is essentially <laughs> pardon the uh, kind of double negative, uh, the same but different as doing regular self-direction is that there are some certainly some different self, some different components to this. The responsibilities in these types of scenarios where you structure things in a trust or LLC are shifted slightly depending on how you are doing it. So uh, it certainly is important to understand the basis of what accounts you can self-direct, checkbook or not. Uh, the difference between doing it directly here at an administrator custodian or doing it with checkbook control. So doing all of your investing directly through the IRA or utilizing a checkbook control function of an LLC or a trust. And then the advantages or the disadvantages of either. So, I mean, certainly there is not one size fits all for this. There is different structures that work specifically well for different types of things. And maybe in one case, you may not necessarily need to utilize checkbook control or in one case you may very well need to. So there are advantages and in certain scenarios where these work very well, in some cases where the perceived benefit might not be as, as stark as you might think. Uh, before we do get started, I do need to uh, give our general waiver that Advanta are our employees. We do not provide any tax or legal advice. Uh, we All of the information that we are presenting here today is for educational purposes only, and any guest speakers that we have are strictly for educational purposes only, and we do not endorse or promote any products that may or may not be sold by other th outside third parties. If you have any questions or you are looking to in get involved with any investment, please consult with a licensed professional, such as a CPA or attorney before entering into any type of financial agreement. Now, if you do have questions following this presentation, please understand that this is not just kind of the last place that you can get it. We do maintain a very uh, up-to-date weekly event event calendar where we have things going on pretty much every week and sometimes multiple things per week. We do either web-based presentations or we do them in office at our different locations. We have office locations here in the Tampa Bay area and Largo, Florida, and we also maintain an office in Atlanta, Georgia and the Buckhead area, but we do certainly do things remotely and we do sometimes travel depending on where <laughs> the different locations are. Now, if you do have questions and you'd like to review this presentation again, we have our Advanta On Demand, which is our YouTube channel, which we host all of our presentations for our, any of our guests, or for any of our presentations, as well as our guest webinars as well. And then we also have an up-to-date blog that we update twice monthly that has insights and tips on current things happening in our industry. Now, most people, may not have heard of self-direction, but the type of self-direction they have heard of really doesn't necessarily the kind that we operate inside of. Now, self-direction just for the purposes of picking your own stocks and securities really isn't what we're getting after today or really what we focus on at all here at Advanta. Uh, and the reason that people haven't heard about this type of self-direction is that there really isn't any vested interest for people like Raymond James and Fidelity to allow you to buy real estate or other investments that you have gone out and chosen. You know, they can't be charging you commissions on something that you're doing all of the work on. So less than about 4% of all of the retirement investments in the United States within any type of retirement plan. So your pensions, your 401ks, IRAs, 
Roth's traditional SEP simple, are, are making up about less than 4% of the IRA retirement investments and a roughly 14, or sorry, $24 trillion investment pool. So there's a lot of money out there that's invested in retirement accounts and only a very, very small fraction is truly self-directed. Now, what is self-direction? So self-direction is the ability of you to buy and acquire things that are not publicly traded. Things like real estate, mortgage notes, private placements of startup companies, LLCs and trusts, precious metals, or even foreign currencies. We can hold, these plans can hold traditional stocks uh, and other types of mutual funds, but those would need to be held at a specific broker. Uh, but the term in our context means that the owner has control over what the IRA is investing in and ultimately what investments are going to be made with the money in that investment as we are not in any capacity a directed investor so we do not make the decisions for you nor do we advise you now some important things to understand uh, with regard to how to move money into these types of plans now these this slide and the next one are a little bit more of a, uh, a personal addition I like to do to my presentations because oftentimes the terminology with some of the basics gets um, misused or the understanding of what it exactly is is not fully understood uh, with <coughs> with the actual people utilizing the movement. So if you have an IRA and you'd like to move money to another IRA, utilize what's called a custodial transfer. It's non-taxable, non-reportable, there's no limits to how many you can do, you're just moving funds from one IRA to another. Now, that has to be done from the same type of account to the same type of account. So a traditional to traditional, Roth to Roth, the same type of account to account. Now. Most people will call this a rollover. Now, that is not necessarily the case. A rollover is a specific type of movement of cash. It is not taxable when done correctly, but you only have to do it between certain types of accounts, namely your employer plans to an IRA. And it's important to understand this because there is tax reporting associated with this, and it's done, done on the side of the issuer and the receiver, and making sure that those both do the Correct reporting is what's going to negate any taxable liability. So if one person makes a small mistake, and there are humans involved, so these sometimes do happen, you can sometimes have a very sizable taxable liability being reported to the IRS. So to give you an example, a 401k administrator distributes $250,000 as a direct rollover for your IRA, but instead of putting code G in box seven on your 1099, which is how specific it has to get to show that that's not taxable. And they put a, let's say code one in there for no known exception, or, or sorry, code seven for no known exception, then you might have the IRS thinking that you owe taxes on $250,000 that you otherwise don't. So if you have a 401k, you obviously have to use a direct rollover, but just make sure that you get the tax reporting done correctly from both both parties and, and you will be fine, but just understand that there are some inherent differences between custodial transfers and rollovers. All right, we do have a question. Of those expenses that you pay personally, of those expenses that you pay personally or the business, not in your eye or checkbook, what can be written off on taxes? Example, you drive to a tax lien sale out of state, you have lunch, you drive back, the IRA checkbook also used by tax liens. Uh, you cannot write off any of those expenses. Um, essentially, any and all expenses directly related to the IRA have to be paid by the IRA. And since the IRA is not the one driving, it is not the one eating lunch, uh, you know, none of those things are deductible since they are personal expenses that you are incurring. Um, you know, those are things that you essentially are, are going to have to eat to a certain extent, no pun intended when you're talking about lunch. But the ultimate goal in this is that essentially, remember, you were paying zero taxes on this. So, you know, whatever small expenses you might have to pay, uh, you know, are really going to just kind of be, you know, just that, just, just a hard expense that you're going to have to incur because of the benefit of you not having to pay any taxes for the investing that you're doing. Now, one of the main points that I indicated in the beginning of this is understanding what accounts that you can self-direct. So the accounts that you can self-direct are enumerated here in front of you. And these can all be utilized under checkbook control as well. So you can utilize a checkbook control LLC, a checkbook control, <coughs> excuse me, uh, sorry, a, a checkbook control trust as well in order to utilize your funds in a much more tightly controlled manner with any of these types of plans. 
Now, what are the differences between these types of plants? They're not all the same, obviously. They have different names. <laughs> but, of course, you know, that is that is ex that is the most uh, shallow version of, of the differences there. Now, the traditional IRA is going to be the most the most common type of account simply because one it is the oldest you've been able to have a traditional IRA since 1975 uh, the legislation was written back in 74 and the first traditional IRAs were being able to be opened and funded in 1975 or 74 to 75 and it is the account that will receive funds from a 401k when you have terminated employment in order to keep you from paying any taxes so it is by far and above the most common type of plan. You get a deduction for adding money in, and then you pay taxes at your ordinary income rate when you distribute money out. The theory being is that once you're taking money out, you are no longer working, and your taxable rate and your, your effective taxable rate, your marginal tax rate will be much lower, so you'll be paying much lower taxes than you would have if you had realized the income directly when you were directly when you were working and also any of the gains, whether that be capital gains or whether that be ordinary income of any income derivation or equ equitable increase in the sale of assets in that plan are completely non-taxable. So you don't have any basis to track or any other complicated formulas. It's just a simple cash out marginal tax rate calculation that you need to do via 1099 when you take money out of a traditional IRA. So very common people people are very familiar with it. Now, the other one going top left up to the right is the Roth IRA. The Roth IRA is very popular because people always see the big big flashing lights of no taxes. And and there is that is correct to an extent. You do not pay any taxes on qualifying Roth distributions. What does a qualifying Roth distribution mean? It means the account's been open for 5 years. You were of the age of 59 and a half. And any Roth conversions that you have done have also aged for five years before distributing earnings. So let's say you are 60 years old, you've had the account open for 10 years and haven't done any Roth distributions, and you have been earning cash for <clears throat> the past 20 years in that account. You can distribute that and you pay absolutely zero taxes. But like I said, that is kind of the truth when it comes to not paying taxes with a Roth IRA. All of the contributions that you do going into it are after tax. So you have paid tax on the money going in. And if you do any Roth conversions, meaning that you take money from a traditional IRA and put it into a Roth IRA, you are going to be paying taxes on the amount of that money, which is an unlimited amount of money between the traditional to the Roth IRA. But you are paying taxes at your ordinary income levels in order to do that type of movement via a conversion to a Roth IRA. Very powerful tools. You've been able to have these since 1998. A lot of people really like them, but again, it's just important to understand where the uh, the implications for taxation come into that. Now, the other five that are up here, I'm not going to spend as much time on them, but it is important to note that the three kind of going top right to the bottom left, the SEP IRA, Simple IRA, and the Individual K plan are all business type plans. The SEP IRA is most commonly associated with the traditional IRA. A good way to think about it is the SEP IRA is a traditional IRA on steroids. There's two portions of it. You have the SEP portion and the traditional IRA portion. A SEP IRA allows an individual to defer up to 25% of their compensation, their Schedule C earned income, W-2 income. It allows them to defer up to 24 sorry, 25% of that up to $55,000 into that plan on an annual basis. Now, keep in mind, you have to be a very high wage earner in order to max that out, but you can get a lot of money in there. Creating a corporate deduction for how you draw your money corporately, and if you're a, a self-employed individual, sole employee of a of a uh, of an LLC or something, it can certainly help to mitigate corporate taxes, and then you also get a personal deduction for your fifty five or sixty five hundred dollars of personal income being contributed to that plan as well. But everything going into a set plan is tax deductible, meaning that it is growing tax deferred. There is no such thing as a Roth SEP IRA. However, you can make SEP contributions and convert them into a Roth, but that's kind of a strategy for a different presentation. Uh, Anthony asked, how long does it take to set up and what is the minimum account balance? The account takes about a day to set up and the uh, minimum account balance, there is none, but obviously kind of looking at what you are looking to invest in um, and, and, and what your strategy is, is going to kind of dictate, uh, you know, what the bottom threshold of that is and, and what makes sense. But we do not have any stated account, mount, account minimums. 
And for the most part, people with LLCs and trusts hold zero cash with us. So they just pay their fees personally, which is allowable uh, per IRS rules to pay custodial fees personally. So data set up and then just kind of depends on what you're doing. And we can, we can kind of look at that on a case by case basis as to what makes sense. The simple IRA is a very bad name for a rather complicated plan uh, that is relatively antiquated, but still does kind of hold uh, hold hold a basis in today's market. Um, it is it was intended to be replaced by Acts of Congress with the SEP IRA to simplify everything. The SEP IRA stands for Simplified Employer Pension. Uh, the Simple IRA is the Savings Incentive Match Plan for Employers. Um, so the the Simple Plan allows for about twelve thousand five hundred dollars of cash to be electively put in by the employee, and then the employer will have a a few options if they're going to do a profit sharing match or a few other things with that plan. Now. It's all well and good. Um, it's, it's kind of one of those things where I leave it for another presentation to really jump in and, and, and break apart what the simple SEP and individual 401k plans are. Uh, the individual 401k plan is a really popular one uh, for two reasons. One, it has two components. One, just the money you take out of your personal paycheck, which is either eighteen or $24,000 a year uh, if you're over or under the age of 50 and a half. And then you can contribute up to 25% of your net operating income of your business to all the participants of the plan, uh, not to exceed $35,000. So you can get quite a bit of money, you know, 35 plus 18 or 24 into that plan on an annual basis. And the other really cool thing is that you can make a 401k plan a Roth 401k plan. So pretty cool stuff there. A lot of different strategies that go into the SEP simple and individual 401k stuff. Um, and the individual 401k, you can utilize checkbook control without having to utilize an LLC or a trust. Um, again, that one's, that one's another presentation for another day, but the individual 401k plan, you can do an LLC or a trust like we're going to talk about today, or you can, you can not, and you can structure it in a way where you don't have to go through that, that other portion of it. Educations and savings account, health savings accounts are relatively self-explanatory uh, to the point that health savings accounts are accounts that you add in money, grows tax free and then you get tax-free distributions for qualifying health expenses, and education savings account, same basic principle goes along with that. Okay, we have a question regarding health savings accounts. Uh, who does health savings accounts? Do they work like checking accounts? Uh, we, we administer health savings accounts, and like checking accounts, uh, to an extent, um, HSAs are something I do a whole two-hour presentation on, so I'd recommend going to our YouTube channel, Advana IRA, or sorry, YouTube dot com forward slash Advana IRA and find the most recent HSA webinar I did at the end of last year. It's uh it's it's good to understand because there's a lot of different ways to do it and for an ex to an extent yes but to an extent no. So um, feel free to give me a call I can kind of jump more into that with you. Um, uh, I saw someone had their hand raised. Uh, uh, please do type the question in if you have a if you have something as uh, the hand raised does not. Um, uh, uh, spark a, a question to answer. Uh, here's the enumerated um, uh, limits. <laughs> um, one thing that I did not update, we just got uh, confirmation today uh, that the HSA family plan actually went up by 150 bucks for the contribution limit. So you can actually add in $6,900 to an HSA family plan if and only if you have qualifying high deductible health care coverage. Uh, what that is, again, have a whole presentation on it. It's uh, it's kind of a uh, a very in depth type of plan for you to understand. But there's everything enumerated. So um, if you, if you do have any questions, feel free to fire them off. But that's kind of a a good one to understand right there. Uh, John, yes, we do administer uh, education savings accounts or ESAs. Uh, we certainly do. Uh, we don't do a ton of them just because the contribution limits are a little bit low for those, and the nature of some self-directed investments doesn't always lend itself to self-directing ESAs. Uh, <clears throat> but I do have clients that have done very well with them or have gotten very savvy with the lower, <coughs> excuse me, priced investments, things like tax tax certificates and uh, small lending programs and um, have, have done very well with ESAs and we certainly do administer them. So not a problem. We can certainly hold your ESA for your beneficiaries. Not a problem. So some investment options. Now keep in mind all of these options can be done under a checkbook control function. So if you'd like to have 
the ability to buy real estate, invest in notes, do futures trading, buy private stock. You can do all that under the single member LLC or a checkbook control trust as well. You can buy membership shares in a single member LLC through another LLC or you know, get really kind of interesting layering options with, with how you really elect to structure these things. So just understand that the options are out there. There's not necessarily one size fits all for this and being able to Understand the investment structures and investment options is really important with understanding what can go into this vessel because not everything is going to work underneath of the checkbook LLC or checkbook control function. And the reason I say that is because people will more often than not, maybe not necessarily want to take all of their money and, and self-direct it, but they think, hey, I'm going to put it in this LLC and I can do whatever I want with it. If you want to continue to do any type of securities trading, that's stocks, bonds, mutual funds, things like that. I absolutely encourage you to leave whatever you want to do with that type of investing at a dedicated broker. Because if you utilize an LLC or a trust under an IRA and then open up a brokerage account underneath of that entity, the broker is probably more than likely going to misreport it as a taxable entity. And you're going to have quite the headache in trying to get them to uh, readjust the reporting, reissue 1099s and things like that for um, you know dividends, payouts, uh, distributions to limited partnerships and things like that. So just understand if you're doing checkbook control, utilize it only for the self-directed type investments. So your real estate, mortgages, tax certificates, tax deeds, uh, lending, private stock, things like that. Just make sure that you carve out the money that you're utilizing for this type of investment strictly for this type of investing. Uh, Robert asked, describe Timberland investing briefly. Uh, are you referring to like Timberland as in like buying land and selling the rights for harvesting trees? Um, if you can be a little bit more specific with that, I'm happy to, um, to, to jump into that a little bit more specifically. So things that you can't invest in. Now, the IRS is not – specifically state what you can invest in, they only really give you guidance on what you can't and whom you can't deal with. So the two things that you cannot invest in, you cannot buy a life insurance policy in your IRA. Your IRA is not a living, breathing person. It can't be the sole beneficiary of a life insurance payout. They're also typically paid out tax exempt anyway. And it cannot buy anything that derives its value from, you know, complete subjectivity. You can't necessarily buy something like antiques, alcohol, artwork, stamps, coins. And the reason is the name of the game for this is being able to accurately assign a assess a value to what you have in your IRA. Now, how do you assess value to anything that's inherently subjective? You know, you have a rare bottle of wine. What's it worth? Well, if someone hates wine, not a whole lot. Uh, or, you know, if you have a piece of modern art and you have someone that really likes, uh, you know, Renaissance paintings, you're not going to get them to, you know, necessarily say that. However, um, you know, with very little pull one way or another, real estate um, or a loan or a series of payments has definable value. So that's really kind of what the IRS is looking for is the ability to um, appraise, assess, and otherwise determine a fair market or marketable value of the assets held by the IRA. And in this case, you're looking at essentially the whole picture of an LLC or a trust and what it holds for your IRA as well. Now, I said that the IRS does not define what you can invest in uh, with the exception of those prohibited investments, but so they do define relatively specifically whom you cannot invest with. These are called disqualified persons. Now, the IRA owner and the spouse are off limits. You cannot directly buy or sell yourself something from your IRA, and neither can you do the same from your spouse. Also, imagine a family tree in front of you. Anyone directly up and down from you in your family tree is off limits as well. So direct lineal descendants and ascendants of you personally are off limits. So you cannot directly buy or sell something or have them utilize something in that capacity. So whereas I covered selling and buying, that's easy enough. Although here's one that may, may kind of illustrate the point a little bit better. I had a client who purchased a house in Auburn, Alabama because his daughter and through his IRA because his daughter was going to be 
uh, going to Auburn. Now, he rented that house out to his daughter and her friends. They were paying rent, but his IRA was getting a direct benefit from a disqualified individual. That, in turn, was a disqualifying event for his IRA. So it's not necessarily just the transacting. It's also the direct benefit or utilization of that asset by an IRA <clears throat> disqualified person that can also get you in trouble as well. Are parents in law disqualified? Um, it can get kind of tricky with in-laws because whereas you directly lending or buying something from an in-law is not, them going down with their IRA can be because essentially anytime that you are named as a direct beneficiary of anyone's account, you will also become a disqualified individual. So by default, if you and your wife are named as beneficiaries of their IRA retirement plans or their estate, then you certainly could be um, considered a disqualified individual. Cousins, <clears throat> cousins are where I kind of say you start getting a lot more um, less iffy, if you will, when it comes to dealing with uh, with um, disqualified individuals. Um, essentially, their IRAs can't go down, but your IRAs can go up with in-laws to an extent. Um, the one real weird one uh, in and someone just asked, uh, brothers and sisters are not disqualified, um, and they are fully non-disqualified, meaning that if my brother has a house, and that goes with in-laws as well, if my brother has a house, I can buy my brother's house, or I can sell my IRA house to my brother. I can have him live or rent in it, or her, you know, sister, or what have you. Uh, the issue is with that, you have to, have to, have to, have to make sure that you're doing this on a fair market value basis. So if your brother-in-law, sister-in-law, brother, sister, whomever it may be that follow, qualifies into that kind of, that, that bracket of non-disqualified, if you, you, let's say they have a property that's worth $125,000 appraised, uh, buying it for $25,000 in your IRA is still an issue. Um, you know, it, you, I would say that, you know, buying it for 120 or maybe, uh, you know, 130 or, you know, somewhere around the, the lines of the appraised value is certainly fine if there's a small discount, you know, who's to say. But egregious discounts and things that are going significantly below market or something that you could say is a direct undue benefit to your IRA is where you can really get in trouble. So just understand if you're going to deal with those people, make sure it's on a fair market value basis and, and you'll pretty much stay clear of any issues. But it is very important to make sure that you stay on top of the fair market value basis and also understanding whom you can and can't deal with. It's, it's very important because in these structures, <coughs> You have to understand that just because you maybe are doing something through a checkbook control function does not absolve you from any of the rules. Um, you know, it may allow you some more flexibility, certainly, and it may allow you to do things that your administrator says that you cannot do. But those are not necessarily things that your the administrator is telling you you cannot do because it's prohibited. They're telling you you can't do it because maybe it's operationally infeasible for them to let you do it, or it's just not something that they're interested in holding. All of the IRS rules and regulations are still going to apply. You just might have more liberty to um, invest as you see fit while still being governed by those rules. But here are a few enumerated portions of, of violations of the disqualified persons rules that I kind of went over earlier. Uh, it's They're all kind of self-explanatory. Your spouse this IRA owns a piece of real estate and you want to sell your IRA portion of that property, um, you can't sell it back to them. You can partner with disqualified individuals, and that's kind of an interesting uh, topic as well, is that just because you cannot directly buy or sell to a disqualified individual does not mean that you cannot do what's called a tenant in common or a TIC purchase where you define the percentages of ownership on the deed, and then each person contributes that amount of capital to the closing, and then in turn you buy it as 50-50 partners, 60-40, 30-70, uh, you know, 99.8 <laughs> to 0 0.02 partners, you know, just whatever works, you can you can essentially make, make, make a deal out of it. But it's just important to understand if you're going to deal with a disqualified individual, that you are doing it truly as a fair market value basis and, and, and no other way. Or sorry, as a as a partnership in no other way, and also on a fair market value basis, if that's if that's what you're doing. So checkbook control with an IRA. We've gotten through most of the front load, and we've gotten through the good basis of this pyramid of understanding exactly what kind of goes into choosing the right kind of plan, 
the types of things that you can and can't invest in, the people you, whom you can and can't deal with. Uh, but now it's time to really dig into to why you're here today of checkbook control with an IRA. What does it mean? What are the differences? What are the benefits? Uh, what are the downfalls? So a custodial or administrator account is just that. You open an account with Advanta IRA. Uh, we administer all the cash that you have. We pay all the bills for all of your assets. And we don't charge necessarily to pay bills and things like that once you've purchased an asset. Um, we also receive all of the income and apply it directly to the appropriate asset. So um, you know, everything's taken care of in-house. You know, you're not doing any of the bookkeeping. You're not doing any of the record keeping yourself. You know, we're taking care of all of that in-house. Now, another way, uh, oh, sorry, I should have moved uh, checkbook, control, checkbook control account down one more. And the client must contact the administrator in a custodial capacity uh, to issue any <clears throat> purchases or expenses. Uh, but things like that aren't, aren't very hard. You just need to, you know, fax us in or email us a request and we get it paid same day if we get it before 12. So the turnarounds for these things aren't necessarily as, as long as a lot of people like to think. Uh, there's kind of a pervasive sentiment that, Oh, if you don't use checkbook control, you submit something and it takes them a week to pay things. So um, it's, it's just, it's just not true. You know, you got to understand that things are, things get done quickly. We try to make it as easy as possible. So that way, you know, clients can directly use our service without being feel like they're forced into a checkbook control type situation, but they do work really well for certain types of things. And then the checkbook control account the client personally obtains control over the cash in the IRA using the bank account they set up for the LLC or the trust and the client is able to directly issue payments out of the account and they receive all the deposits directly into that bank account as well. <coughs> all right, Anthony asks, so can I buy discounted real estate and IRA owner finance it to future purchasers? Yeah, you can certainly do carryback financing on an IRA owned piece of real estate. Um, obviously that discounted real estate has to come from you know, a qualified third party, you can't be selling it to yourself or have any interest in, you know, the entity that's selling it to your IRA. But sure, if you find a good deal on a piece of real estate, uh, and either you want to rehab it or don't, or you just want to flip it back out there um, and then hold the paper on it and finance it. Absolutely. I have clients that do that all the time uh, and for various different structures. Had a client up in, in, in North Georgia that did very, very well doing um, discounted real estate purchases on, um, land-owned uh, trailer parks and, and land-owned uh, mobile homes. Um, so there's there's all sorts of different structures that you can utilize if you want to do uh, owner financing within an IRA, but it is certainly a very viable, viable option. So everyone's heard LLC. You see LLC on a bunch of stuff. Heck, even when you came to our website, you saw Advanta IRA Services LLC. It stands for Limited Liability Company. Everyone's seen it, probably heard it, may even understand a little bit what it is, but what are the parts of an LLC? Well, it's important to understand, especially if you're going to be utilizing one, you need to understand the very basic constituent parts of this thing in order to actually utilize it. Uh, Andres, uh, can I partner with my self-directed IRA to acquire with a hard loan and investment property? Yes, to an extent, partnering and then acquiring financing can get kind of tricky. Your IRA can certainly borrow money. It has to be non-recourse financing. Uh, but if you're going to partner with your IRA and then also acquire a loan, that's kind of one of those things where it just gets to be complicated to the point where I've never personally seen someone been able to do that. Um, I would say bringing in another investor partner might be a little bit easier than that because you run into issues with extensions of personal credit to your IRA because if there's a loan on it, you know, your IRA is going to be signing a loan, but then you're also going to have to sign repayment of that loan and you're not allowed to extend personal credit or personally guarantee any type of debt to your IRA. So it just gets to be kind of a little bit tricky with that. Um, I would love to see someone do it. It's inherently not necessarily what I would say prohibited from the onset. It's just not something that I have seen done successfully, but I, I would love to. So the key components of an LLC, you have the shareholders, which are the owners of the company. And in this case, your IRA would be named as the sole shareholder. So Advanta IRA, FBO, Jane or John Smith IRA, 
number. And that is how you set up initially the ownership of the LLC. So in this case, the IRA is going to wholly own the entity that in turn will be utilized for checkbook control. Now, the functionality of this has to be has to be coordinated by a manager because otherwise, if it was member managed, which we do not allow for those types of entities, we as the administrator would have to sign everything. We'd have to sign all the checks, review all the documents, and at that point, we're just doing it like we would normally, so there's no point in having an LLC. So the main crux of really kind of getting the checkbook control function is making sure that you have a manager named of that LLC and that the LLC is inherently manager managed. So you have a single member manager managed LLC and this is all stated on the operating agreement. So the operating agreement is going to be the document that defines the relationship of the shareholders member the manager of the LLC and all of the extensions of liabilities, sorry, the limits of liabilities, the responsibilities of the parties, and it's going to be signed <clears throat> typically, typically needs to be signed by the manager as well, but it's always signed by the member. So that is essentially what we need in order to <clears throat> set up one of these types of entities within your IRA. Now keep in mind an operating agreement is not necessarily required if you just go to somewhere like SunBiz in the state of Florida to register an LLC. Uh, just registering an LLC because a lot of people, you know, kind of come to us and say, oh, I've, I've done LLCs plenty of times, not a problem. Sometimes they have, but a lot of times they haven't. They've just gone to a state, registered a name, and think they're off to the races. That's not true. You do have to have some additional documentation. It doesn't have to be drafted by an attorney per se, but I do recommend someone with either extensive legal knowledge personal experience, experiential knowledge, or an attorney to draft this kind of legal document for your IRA. Uh, can my wife be the manager or trustee? Uh, they can certainly be the manager. There is, the trustee essentially crosses a little bit of a line with what's called being a fiduciary. Uh, trustee is inherently bound to act in the specific best interest of the entity in which they are acting as the, uh, in a trustee capacity too. Uh, one of the things you are not allowed to do to an IRA is act in a fiduciary capacity to your IRA. So here at Advanta, we are of the opinion uh, that we will not allow for people to act as their own um, trustee or you know, a disqualified individual to act as the trustee of the trust. So you do need to have a little bit of an arm's length from that. So you need to have a, a qualified trusted third party act as the trustee of your trust. Uh, thanks for the question, Anthony. So same thing goes for a trust as it does an LLC. People have probably heard of um, trust, you know, <clears throat> for many years, and they've been around for a really long time. Uh, they have their basis starting back um, uh, with, with priests and churches because, um, you know, clergy were not allowed to own property and a lot of other things. So you have a lot of these types of trusts go back a very long way. And, and so people have heard about these things for a long time, but also understanding what goes into a trust is somewhat of a thing, kind of like an LLC. You've heard about it for all these years, but what really goes into it? So a trust is going to be a document and it operates very similarly to an LLC. However, in this type, you have the grantor. So you have the individual that is adding assets into this trust. So essentially they are giving up the control of their assets to be managed by a trustee that is going to ultimately be managed and then there will be a specific beneficiary named of that trust that will be the that all of those assets will be managed for the benefit of now the grantor and the beneficiary in a lot of times are going to be two different people. However, in this case, we are going to be utilizing what's called a grantor beneficiary trust, meaning that the grantor, in this case, the <laughs> excuse me, the IRA is also going to be named as the beneficiary of the trust. So kind of like in an LLC where the owner is going to be the one that's going to get all the benefit of the uh, management of the assets. That's the same way you kind of structure a trust to act in the, in the capacity of an LLC is that the grantor is also going to be named as the beneficiary whom the trustee will manage the manage the assets for the ultimate benefit of. So to clarify, for an LLC, the IRA owner can serve as the manager too. Correct. That, that is correct. Uh, so can I be the manager of the LLC that is owned wholly by my IRA? Correct. And we'll get into the case law here, I believe, in about two slides. That specifically covers, Joel, the, uh, the, the actual case law that kind of examines a bit of the IRS looking at this kind of structure and, and actually 
you know, not having an issue with it. So it's, it's, it has been examined in, in that capacity. Um, so just, there's a bunch of different types of trust. There's not kind of one size fits all. There's revocable trust, meaning obviously the trust can be revoked. There are irrevocable trust, meaning that it cannot be revoked. Uh, trust set up for people's special needs, life insurance trust, uh, living in or vivos trust. There is, I mean, you could probably literally just name different types of trust for probably about an hour and not repeat yourself. But for the purposes of what you need, um, and if you start doing research on trust past just this presentation, you're going to run into a ton of different types of trust. That's not necessarily so important. What you need to understand is that what you need is a grantor beneficiary trust, and most of the time it's going to be modeled on a personal property trust, a revocable personal property trust. That is what nine out of 10 of these that we see are. So if you're doing research, just kind of, you know, use those as your keywords, grantor beneficiary trust, uh, personal property grantor trust, uh, and you'll probably come up with something that kind of fits your needs if you're interested in doing the trust specifically. So the investment strategies of the checkbook control IRA. Uh, it is an entity that the IRA owns 100% of. So that's a really important thing to understand is that either an LLC or a trust, it is going to be wholly owned by the, LL by the IRA. It doesn't really matter like how you structure it per se. It's just the IRA owns 100% of the entity that essentially is going to be managed for the benefit of that, that IRA. Now, checkbook control allows for the manager to write checks, directly fund investments, pay bills, sign contracts, uh, you know, foreclose on properties, everything that you would associate with buying property is going to be, or buying an asset essentially, is going to be managed by the LLC manager or the trustee, tru trustee of the trust uh, for the ultimate benefit of the IRA. And... <clears throat> If the IRA owner wants to be a manager, uh, you should really consult with an attorney beforehand. Uh, like I said, there is case law specific to this, but it always is encouraged, depending on what you're going to be doing with the LLC, that you really kind of run that by a legal expert. Um, you know, uh, spending 100 you know, maybe $100, $200 for an hour of an attorney's time up front is a lot cheaper than having an IRA disqualified for a prohibited transaction for something that you did not think was an issue that turned out to be. So I always recommend pay a little bit of money up front, get good advice, set yourself up with a really good base of this pyramid, and you won't have any problems. <clears throat> now... I always do kind of caution people, we do not do LLC drafting or trust drafting in-house. Um, I really do encourage people not to go places that offer one-stop shops because it just, one, you're going to pay a ton of money for it. Uh, typically, we can, uh, uh, Patrick, yeah, this recording, this, this presentation will be on YouTube, so just, you know, later today or tomorrow, go to YouTube, this will be on there. And then all my other presentations are on our YouTube channel. So uh, feel free to review them at your leisure. Thanks. So again, uh, we can typically get you out of doing an LLC, getting the account set up, um, you know, for well less than, you know, a $1,000. Um, you're, you're probably going to be looking at somewhere with our fees and getting an LLC document drafted by an attorney, registered with the state and everything for probably around the $600, $650 mark. I mean, it's a lot cheaper than other places. And you also get the benefit of having engaged an attorney to answer some of your questions in that capacity as well. Um, again, there's no secret formula for this kind of stuff. Uh, we do try to be as... Um, as guiding as possible to our clients uh, with the experience that we've had, what we've seen clients do, what we've seen clients succeed and fail at. So just keep in mind that it's good to ask questions, but it's also good to have resources as well, which we can certainly provide to you. Now, kind of getting into the meat and potatoes of where the IRS has examined this kind of stuff. Initially, back in 1996, uh, there was a court case, Swanson v. Commissioner, where the uh, individual Swanson had set up a an LLC had new sh had set up a new LLC with newly issued shares that his IRA purchased. So he had a new LLC. No one owned the shares. Sold it to his uh, sold it to his IRA. The IRA funded the LLC, uh, and he he operated a uh, shipping company personally. And then the LLC operated a uh, accounts receivable purchasing uh, practice. Now, the IRS came knocking. And they said, "Hey." you know, you have sold a personally owned asset when you form this LLC to your IRA. 
Um, then they came back and examined it, and it was found that because the newly formed LLC shares were owned by no one prior to the LLC being funded by the IRA, that it did not cons constitute a prohibited transaction. Now, after this is all said and done, he wins the case. He actually goes back and sues the, the IRS for legal fees to recover, um, you know, maybe painting a little bit bigger of a target on his back than need be. Uh, but a few things that it didn't cover is, one, he was paying himself a salary out of that LLC, which is a uh, big, big no-no. And uh, he was also buying accounts receivable from his personal uh, shipping and receiving company as well. So there's a lot of things in this case that aren't necessarily examined. And keep in mind, when you go to tax court, they do not examine the periphery of the case. They look specifically to the issue at hand. So if the issue at hand is John Smith's receipt from August 2nd of 1999, they're not examining everything around it. It is strictly just the the facts of the case related to the one issue that they have brought up. So keep in mind that you have to take a lot of the stuff that you get from IRS tax court with a big grain of salt because it doesn't always cover the big picture of what else might have been an issue. So keep in mind, um, good something to know. So then we have a tax court memo from a gentleman named Ellis in 2013. Now, the reason this is public is because anytime that you settle with the IRS, it is not a public, not a public uh, item that you can review. But he did end up going to trial and lost with the IRS on this. The IRS <coughs> uh, had uh, audited him and deemed his IRA to be in violation of Code 4975, which deals with prohibited transactions. So they said he did something wrong. Uh, Rob, if you can type in your question, happy to answer it. <clears throat> um, so he said he did something wrong. Now, what he did was he had an IRA-owned LLC. He was operating it in relatively good faith, but he was paying himself a salary for the services that he was providing, reimbursing himself for expenses, paying himself for the time that he utilized on it. Um, now, because he decided to take it to court and not settle, he ended up losing the case. His IRA was disqualified. But specifically in the memo, they said that his actions acting as manager of that LLC were not the issue. The only issue that they had was the fact that he was paying himself a salary. So again, if you're going to do this, you have to do it <clears throat> unpaid. You can't take a salary. You have to be the one that is just doing it as strictly just offering the managerial duties for free to the LLC, that's it. <clears throat> All right, our first case study. So Joe's real estate deal has $150,000 that he wants to buy real estate with. He wants to buy single family rental properties and he finds a house for sale at $100,000 that needs an additional $20,000 worth of work to get it ready to rent. He projects the property will net about $1,000 a month after repair. Uh, yeah, Rob, just give me a call. Um, the, the number will be up at the end of the presentation, so we can certainly uh, review that, that situation, um, you know, specifically. But uh, uh, thank you very much. So how can he buy this property? Well, there's a couple different ways. Now, he can buy it directly through an IRA, which we have – a lot of our clients do. I would say just roughly more than half of our clients do not use an LLC or a trust for this kind of stuff. Uh, they use it directly through the IRA. Um, so he completes the IRA application. He transfers money over. Uh, he gets a contract in the name of the IRA. So Advana IRA, FBO, Joe Smith IRA. Uh, he approves the contract. We sign it. We issue escrow. All of the closing documents are in the name of the IRA. Uh, we complete closing. We follow up to get all the deed, to get the deed once it's recorded, the original title policy for the title insurance. <clears throat> um, and then it just continues to grow. We collect all of the income. He tracks it on his online access to his account and it runs pretty smoothly. Now, utilizing an LLC. So the purchase of the property <clears throat> functionally doesn't change. Property is going to have a contract. It's going to have a settlement statement. There's going to be deeds. There's going to be title policies for the title insurance on the property. But the function of how you actually go through buying it, uh, Nick, again, please uh, please type in the question. Happy to answer it, but the uh, the hand raise um, doesn't uh, generate something specifically. <clears throat> um, but the front end of what you do before the property is purchased does change. So Joe still needs to open the account, still needs to fund it. 
But instead of getting a contract draft in the name of the IRA, he will need to then in turn set up an LLC. So the LLC is going to be set up. He's going to get an operating agreement. And he's going to need to file articles with the state. He's going to need to get a tax ID number so he can open up a bank account with the particular uh, bank that he's going to be banking with. Uh, once we get copies of the operating agreement that the client's approved, and we make sure that the IRA is named as the beneficial, uh, as the member of the as uh, as the member of the LLC, uh, then in turn we will issue all of the funds that he has requested into the bank account of the LLC. At that point, he just manages the operations like he, like we would previously, but he's going to be managing the operations. He's going to be writing all the checks for repairs, going to be collecting all of the rent, buying the real estate directly in the name of the LLC. So he's going to be signing the purchase purchase for the contract for purchase. He's going to be signing the settlement statements, going to be approving the deed, and all that kind of stuff is going to go directly to Joe now instead of Advanta for, for this type of account. Now, Going forward, again, everything's going to go directly into that LLC's bank account. Advan is going to have no direct hand in the day-to-day -day operations of this LLC. Trust, again, we like to put this up here just so you, that you do have a good understanding of the, the roundedness of it, but I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it. Just, to, just understand that the trust operates almost exactly like the LLC. He opens the account and funds it. Instead of providing us with a copy of the operating agreement, he's going to provide us with a copy of the trust agreement that we're going to review and approve. He's, he's going to review and we're going to approve. Uh, the nice thing about trust is that, you know, there really isn't anything public per se about anyone with the trust. So it does offer a higher degree of anonymity if that is a concern to you. However, even with an operating agreement and an LLC, uh, you know, we can leave your name off of it and just identify you by account number, which is essentially just as just as an anonymous as doing a trust. So depending on what you're looking to accomplish, one may or may not make more sense than the other. <clears throat> so again, in this case, the, the documents can be approved by Joe and then we would fund the trust. All the trust operations in this case are going to be managed by the trustee. Uh, the trustee is going to collect all the rents, all the income, and then pay all the bills, and then also go through any type of closings or anything else like that that may need to be done uh, later on during the operation of that entity. <clears throat> now, this one slide is what I would say is causes the most issues with any client that elects to do this type of investing. So if you'd like to remove cash from an LLC trust, LLC or a trust, it's a very specific way you need to do it. And when I say remove cash, I mean <clears throat> you like to take money personally. So if you need to, if you want to take money for retirement, take a vacation, improve your house, do anything where you're going to actually take money out of that account, you absolutely have to take it out the correct way. And the correct way is not just writing yourself a check from the trust or the operating account of that LLC. You need to write a check from the LLC or the trust back to Advanta so that way we can deposit the funds and then that way we can distribute it to you with proper 1099 reporting. Even if this is a Roth account, there is still a 1099 issued for anything issued out of a Roth account, but with a specific code in box seven indicating that it is non-taxable. So it's a non-taxable event to you regardless if it's a Roth account, but keep in mind that it still has to be properly reported. Otherwise, even with the Roth account, you can get hit with penalties for improper distributions of cash from these types of accounts, and then essentially you're still paying tax on it. So very important to understand how the functionality of taking money out of an LLC or a trust works. LLC trust to Advanta, then to you. Important, simple, but people get hung up on that one quite a bit. So now the pros and cons. One of the other things I wanted you to take out of this is that the pros and cons of using a checkbook control versus an administrator. So utilizing a, an administrator model, so not utilizing a, a checkbook control LLC or trust. A big pro is that you're almost pretty much kept at arm's length from your IRA funds. You don't have to worry about accidentally paying something you're not going to that you shouldn't be or anything else like that. You are essentially, you know, as, as far away as you can really get while still having an IRA with this type of funds. You're less likely to engage in a prohibited transaction. Now, kind of going back to the beginning of my presentation where I had a client that bought a house in Auburn uh, and had his daughter live in it. Well, 
he did that through an LLC. Now, if we had caught, we would have caught that because if he had, or the way that we would have caught that is that he would have sent us, a, excuse me, he would have sent us a lease agreement. Anytime that we see the same last name on a lease agreement, a contract or something like that, we always ask, hey, who is this person in relation to you? Now, at that point, he said, oh, it's my daughter. And we would have explained to him, hey, you know, you can rent it out to her friends, but she can't, she can't live there. So that's where we can kind of help catch the, the small stuff, you know, the stuff that you have no real ill intent or really, you know, malicious intent of doing something wrong or trying to avoid any rules or commit any type of illegal activity, but still is going to be something that can trip you up significantly if, if not caught. And you also have clear records of all IRA activity. If you need to get, uh, you know, rent payment records for the last eight years of a tenant that's been in a house because of some type of legal matter or you just need it, it's extremely easy for us to get those records for you. Um, now, if you are doing this in a checkbook control or, or similar type of model, you're going to have to make sure that you are keeping diligent records in order for you to be able to provide those records timely and get them in a, in a format that is easily understood. Uh, some of the cons of doing this, uh, you might have some more fees for multiple assets. Now, just for having one asset, if you have a bunch of expenses and income coming in, it's not going to increase your fee basis at all. Um, and you also don't have any ability to write checks for immediate purchases. So things like tax deed sales and, and auctions are where, are where the checkbook control functionality really shines. I would say I typically tell people anytime I have a new client call up and say, hey, I'm interested in doing tax certificates, I immediately bring up them checking out the checkbook control type function because unless the the authority that's selling them will accept a wire uh, the following business day uh, you know there's no real way for us to get a, a check in their hand you know cost effectively the same day especially if they're out of state or not immediately close to us it's just not something that is administratively feasible for us to do um, not that we don't allow clients to do it it just doesn't necessarily work uh, you know, we can't necessarily just write a client a blank check for their IRA for them to go to an auction with. So um, it's just something that I tell people if you're interested in auctions or stuff like that, checkbook control is almost, it's not a requirement, but it's something that needs to be seriously looked at. Now, again, the pros of checkbook control, you have that quick access to your funds. Uh, you can hold more assets with lower fees. So whereas we might charge you... <clears throat> um, Whereas we might charge you uh, for each asset that you're particularly holding or just charge you a flat rate value, you can hold multiple assets in your account with potentially lower fees with a checkbook control function. And you also have the ability in some cases, and this doesn't hold true for everything, some cases to have uh, a little bit greater asset protection or anonymity depending on the state and depending on what you're investing in. That is not a blanket statement by any means. Uh, you would need to check with legal counsel to make sure that you understand, uh, you know, really which one kind of works better for you. The cons, you're responsible for more of the record keeping. You do have less oversight by us, and potentially it could be a little bit easier to engage in a prohibited transaction. And again, those prohibited transactions aren't necessarily going to be things that you are doing with malicious intent or uh, criminal intent. It's just, you know, sometimes honest mistakes can really get you in a lot of trouble, but because you're not having a third-party administrator kind of look over your shoulder with it, it can, you know, essentially it can happen. So which investment strategy is best? I encourage everyone to check with the CPA or attorney to see which one works. Again, depending on what you're doing, we can offer some guidance in that. Um, and it's always possible to switch strategies. So let's say you start with an LLC and it doesn't really work. Um, I had a client once that came to me wanted to do an LLC. Uh, she was going to be purchasing a condo in a 55 plus community that had a long-term tenant and a property management company already in place. And she wanted to use an LLC, a single member LLC to hold it in her IRA. Well, I told her, I was like, you know, if you look at the cost of everything, you know, you may not necessarily get any perceived benefit out of doing that. And sure enough, after she had kind of consulted uh, with her advisor about it, she decided not to utilize that type of structure. And conversely, anytime I hear that someone wants to do an auction, I immediately tell them about this type of strategy because it, it works much better. So just understand that it's not kind of a, a fix-all for any type of, of IRA investing, and you do not have to do it by any means if you're doing self-direction. You can certainly have great success with uh, without.
without doing that. So that pretty much concludes the presentation. Uh, you know, we hit the hit the mark right on an hour today, so I, I want to make sure we respect your time and get you out of here and back to your lives and, and uh, busy schedules with uh, anything that you might have that you need to get done today. Here's my contact information. Feel free to give me a call directly. That is my direct line. Uh, rings right to my desk here at Advanced House, also my email here. If you have any questions specifically, feel free to give me a shout. I am, I am more than happy to converse with you, answer questions, uh, go over strategies, anything like that. So uh, again, thank you all very much for coming today. We really appreciate you being a part of this.